All right. Well, it's it's roughly around 10 a.m. here. I think we'll go ahead and get started. All right, we are live. All right, well, good morning. Welcome everyone to the Cybersecurity Task Force Subcommittee on Statewide Coordination and Collaboration. My name is John Godfrey, and I'm the Chief Information Security Officer and the Associate Vice Chancellor for Information Security with the University of Kansas Medical Center. And to get, to get us started here, could each of you go ahead and introduce yourselves? And I'll just start with the, the person at the top of the list here. So, so Bill, do you mind starting? No problem. Uh, my name is Bill Glenn. I'm the Executive Director of the Kansas Intelligence Fusion Center. Thank you, Bill. Um, looks like, Doug, you're next. Uh, Doug Robinson. I'm the Executive Director of NASIO National Association of State Chief Information Officers. All right. Thank you. Um, it looks like, uh, Jay, you're next. Good morning. Uh, this is Jay Emler. I am Deputy Attorney General and Chief Information Security Officer for the Office of Attorney General Derek Schmidt. All right. Great. Thank you. And Jeff, looks like you're next. Good morning, Jeff Maxson. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for the state of Kansas. Thank you. And I believe that covers everyone on the subcommittee. Did I, I don't think I missed anyone. So uh, we'll go ahead and, and, and continue on here. So the goal of this subcommittee is to identify, facilitate, and make recommendations to develop successful cross-government and cross-industry collaboration and coordination efforts to further cybersecurity within the state of Kansas. And with that backdrop, we're gonna go ahead and kick things off this morning with a broad overview and a discussion around coordination and collaboration. Our discussion will frame ideas for our subcommittee, and then we'll discuss some, some general high-level ideas around short and long-term recommendations. And then we'll finally round out the conversation identifying resources and speakers that we may need to potentially pull into our future meetings to help guide and, and continue the conversation. So with that, I'm pleased to welcome Doug Robinson, Executive Director of the National Association of State Chief Information Security Officers, or NASIO. And he's gonna provide us with an overview to start our conversation today. So Doug, thank you for joining us and I'm gonna turn it over to you. It's still on mute, Doug. But what I was saying was absolutely brilliant. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, glad to be able to brief uh, the, uh, the task force on this important uh, topic and the, and the subcommittee on uh, looking at collaboration and, and coordination. Uh, this is a, a regular activity for us at, uh, at NASIO. I've spoken to many uh, state cybersecurity task forces over the years and committees and commissions and testified on these topics. So glad to bring uh, kind of the NASIO content and some of our research uh, to you. So our, uh, you know, if you look at the cybersecurity space in general, we have two major, two major roles. One is obviously the research and policy and recommendations. Uh, and we conduct uh, regular research, including a biennial national survey, which I'll reflect uh, in some of our data this morning, as well as uh, obviously white papers and recommendations over the, uh, actually since our first uh, issue, uh, which was in 2002, our first major publication on uh, public call to action for public sector uh, information security was in 2002. And then since then, you know, a whole set of recommendations across the board, including uh, one we're going to talk about this morning. In addition, we have a government affairs and advocacy component as well. Uh, NASIO has a, a, a full-time uh, government affairs director in our office in DC. It's been in place since 2008. And we advocate on behalf of state CIOs and state CISOs across the board on, on activities. And you'll see the the results of that, you've already seen it perhaps over the last few months of discussions around a dedicated cybersecurity grant program for state and local governments. So that's a component of you know, what we can talk about this morning, which is the, uh, the outcome of that, which we believe will be very positive and, and certainly by the end of September, early October, uh, and that will set off a whole new set of conversations around the resources that might be available to state and locals to focus on cybersecurity improvement. Um, and again, that's been a longstanding 
high priority of the association uh, since 2008, in fact, when we started to ask for a dedicated funding out of that stream. So with that kind of backdrop, let me talk about a few things today. And I'm going to bring, again, some of the research that we've had over the years to kind of light with some color commentary and provide you some perspective on that. So first thing I'll do is, which would be helpful, is let me go ahead and um, share my screen. Uh, can you all see that now before I continue? Good. I'm I've got a few slides here to share with you all. So let's talk about uh, some of the some of the backdrop of that. So uh, security and, and cybersecurity is a component of a number of services um, that state governments have traditionally provided to local governments. So looks like my, let's go ahead and move this a little bit here. There we go, it was a little frozen up there on Zoom. Uh, so again, this is not this is not new from the standpoint of services that states, particularly state CIO organizations, offer to local governments to their counterparts in, in uh, local government jurisdictions. Uh, and again, again, for for background, uh, the overwhelming majority of the states, over ninety percent of the states, are chargeback organizations, meaning CIOs deliver services to their state agencies and others on a full cost recovery or chargeback model. Um, almost all of them are full cost, meaning 100%, that they receive no general fund appropriations and that their model is that their budget is constructed on their anticipated revenues for all of these services. And some of them are delivered to local government. So you can see from this, this long table uh, that we've been uh, reporting on for several years now. So we have some longitudinal data uh, over the course of several years on our national survey. This is our two, 2020 a survey, the 2021 survey is actually in its final draft version and will be released in October. Uh, and it outlines you know, some of the collaboration going on. But in this case, we have a lot more detailed data. As you can see, if you look at the top five in terms of percents as, as uh, reported by our state CIOs, they were able to select all that applied to this. And you can see that security and infrastructure Security infrastructure services is about half the states are providing those services in some way to local governments. And it might be, for example, they might be part of the of the statewide network, as you can see from the first. That's been traditionally something states have been doing for at least 25 to 30 years. States have been making their, their statewide backbone networks available to local governments, to schools, and to libraries. Uh, but particularly local governments take advantage of that. And the number of states uh, local governments are actually either co-located or they're the state is providing data center hosting or mainframe services that, in a number of states. That's the case, including some of large jurisdictions. You may have seen uh, less than two years ago, the city of Los Angeles um, basically outsourced their entire data center operations to the state of California. So their environment, their compute environment for the city of LA is actually sitting in Sacramento in the, in the data center. So they decided to move in that direction. So you can see some of these other elements. We're gonna, we, we, we've seen this grow. We anticipate additional growth for a variety of reasons. One is simply constrained resources at the local level. One is a lack of, of, uh, of uh, available capital to them, uh, just like state government. They don't wanna spend their capital on, on technology in a constant refresh. Many of them don't have the capabilities and disciplines uh, through retirements or just the, in, the, the inability to have technical competency and, and IT folks available to them except on in a private contractor mode. So many of them are, are kind of rethinking. There are other groups that have advocated for local governments to strongly consider outsourcing all of their information technology, either in a joint collaborative with their state or simply moving to uh, managed services outsourcing model. And we've seen states do that, but I think local governments are clearly uh, we're looking at that. So a big part of that is because they uh, that motivation is because of the increasing risks that they've seen, particularly in the area of cyber disruption and ransomware that are impacting local governments and K through 12 organizations uh, more than they are certainly uh, state government. So again, that's so, so you can see this long list. I won't go through that, but it's just a good example of what of what states are doing in terms of uh, in terms of the movement. Uh, the the. The next item is one that you may have heard the phrase whole of state. And again, we're talking about local government collaboration and coordination. Uh, the whole of state discussion comes into play uh, for several years. NASIO has been talking about the move to a whole of state cybersecurity approach or model, which is really more about 
Uh, they're fo- less they're focused on the executive branch only, which is not the purview of the state CIO and, and CISO in almost all states to a broader construct. Uh, you see this is actually playing out in North Dakota, where the CIO organization uh, through legislation, beginning with an executive order legislation, has been given authority and purview over all branches of government, local government, K through 12 and universities. Very interesting to see how that's going to play out. It's relatively new. Uh, but uh, that, again, that was a discussion that they had uh, based on a number of incidents and the governor felt like there just wasn't enough coordination and collaboration. Uh, so we'll see if that model works. I don't see that being, I, I call it a model, but I'm not sure it's, it's, it's replicable across uh, many states uh, for a variety of reasons, but certainly broader stakeholder engagement, more collaboration, more whole of state discussions, which include the stakeholders listed you know, here, as you see, in terms of the, um, you know, the, the local governments being a key part of that, but also uh, utilities and private sector healthcare, universities, healthcare, prime target of, uh, of a number of, of ransomware attacks, as you, as you know. So uh, let me kind of move on here and talk about uh, quickly connecting the dots. So I'm going to talk about our, our biennial national report with, uh, with our friends at Deloitte Consulting. Uh, for the last 10 years, we have conducted this massive national survey. It's kind of the preeminent view of what's going on in terms of, uh, of state government uh, uh, cybersecurity. The chief information security officers, people, Jeff's counterparts across the states uh, respond to this. We had a remarkable 51 states respond to this survey uh, and it's a very valuable resource. And so I'm gonna just provide a couple of snapshot data points from that around collaboration and, uh, and connecting the dots across um, state and local and higher education. You can see some of the data that only 28% of the states reported they had collaborated extensively uh, across local governments as part of their state security program. We see this as, as problematic, but we also understand the environment. I understand the challenges and resources that states have in terms of extending uh, their, uh, their activities and their resources and providing services to local governments. Some of them don't have those uh, don't have those relationships. You know, our, our, I guess our recommendation on this is we believe that uh, in a kind of a go forward mode from, you know, certainly several years ago is that collaboration with local governments in, in higher education institutions is critical to the overall whole of state landscape and, you know, protecting and remediating and recovering from, from events. Uh, and again, the targets, if you look at things like ransomware and the cyber disruption targets, for the last several years have predominantly been in three sectors and that's local governments, K through 12 and healthcare. Uh, and I think that's you know something that we have to address. And the question on the table for most folks is what's the role of the state? I think you have a set of objectives and outcomes here, which I don't need to go through because you did a great job on, on identifying you know, what those public private partnerships, how they're constructed, what's the role of the state, what can the state actually do? And I think there's a long list of things that perhaps the states can, um, can work on. Uh, so we asked that and in that survey, we asked the question of our chief information security officers, you know, what are the services? It looks like we may have lost Doug here. So we'll, we'll pause for just a couple of moments and see if Doug can rejoin us. I thought I was the one with the bad connection. <laughs> Whoops, I didn't do it. Well, it looks like it's not your turn today, Jay. So in some of these documents, yeah, I'll just yeah. throw out there, some of those documents he's referencing, we have put out in that SharePoint site for folks to review. So some of those are out there, that survey, the CIO and CISO surveys are both out there as well as well as a bunch of others, so. Excellent, thank you, Jeff. I Jay, would say the... Go ahead. I'm sorry, I was just gonna uh, point out to Jay that you all had, had said that the last person to join the meeting had to bring donuts. And I just wanted to bring that up and point that out to Jay. <laughs> uh, well, I, I tried to join first. <laughs> Besides, I brought you guys donuts yesterday at the Fusion Center, so don't hassle me. (laughs) 
Jeff, thanks for sharing that the documents are out there. Um, I know I was I was starting to get excited. It seemed like we were just getting into some good stuff in the presentation there. Um, I'd been taking a couple notes. I was like, you know, uh, pretty exciting content, really interesting to see where some opportunities lie, you know, and, and I think uh, the discussions we're gonna have in this group, especially based on some of that data um, is gonna provide some very interesting conversation. Um, so, so Doug, it looks like we got you back. Welcome back. Yes. Yeah, I think the the uh, the Zoom gods apparently didn't care for what I was saying there. So let me uh, <laughs> let me go back and uh, I think I was sharing my uh, screen there and talking about some results. I don't, I'm not sure what happened there, but let me go back to that. Uh, can you see my slides here? Because we're just about done. Yes. Okay bring that up. Again, I was thinking I was beginning to talk about the results of our survey. You can see the, uh, the survey there, uh, the digital imprint. Again, I'll mention at the end, but uh, all of the reports and studies and surveys that I'm referencing here are all available publicly to you all. So they're all available uh, in digital format on the NASIA website. And they're also supported by a number of, uh, of webinars and webcasts that have been recorded and are available also on the NASIA resource page. So uh, there's a, a, a host of resources around this and I'll reference also a couple of other reports. So again, in 2020, we asked about what cyber services uh, states were providing to locals. And again, you can see uh, rank ordered there, uh, one through five incident management um, in awareness and training, investigation and forensics, uh, SOC Security Operations Center on the SOC side and vulnerability management. Uh, again, awareness and training is going to become, I think, a critical, if not you know, the critical component, particularly from the standpoint, if you look at the, uh, you know, the incidents that we have and the, and the vectors all around, perhaps the, uh, the frailty of the, the human actor, so to speak, in this equation. So employees or contractors are the primary targets uh, for infiltration. And if you look at across the board in the public sector, that's the primary uh, mechanism. Uh, for both the phishing and business email compromise, the BEC, the malware uh, infiltration is all around. Understanding that uh, the the employees and contractors uh, are are not aware of what they should be doing on a daily basis, and they're not really they're not thinking of themselves as part of that. So as you think about expanding services or providing that to local governments, I think that's even becomes more more critical to understand that they probably have less training in this space. Um, and, and I think for, for you all in the task force and others, it's understanding that uh, cybersecurity is not an IT issue. It's a business risk to the continuity of government, whether it's state or local. And I think that continues to be our message, uh, one which uh, both, you know, we need to understand the governors and uh, other elected public officials, legislators, appropriators, others in uh, constitutional offices that are elected all need to be understanding that when they're one of these incidents or disruptive attacks, it's it's not say, well, that's an IT issue. We're good with that. No, this has become a, a business issue to the continuity of government at all levels and needs to be addressed that way. And I think that's the challenge of this awareness and training is that it really needs to elevate the game to be to be serious about uh, any other training that we're doing because it can have uh, very dire consequences on on the operations of, of government. So, you know, the question is for all of these, what's the role of the state and are they, uh, have they constructed a, a portfolio of services that can be made available? Uh, for example, you might be able to provide investigation and forensics, but that might be for a fee. Uh, and it may not be something that the CISO office, in some cases, state chief information security offices have become quite large to serve a lot of, uh, a lot of governments and jurisdictions. That's something that has to, all has to be addressed, and it's based on obviously each individual state making those uh, making those discussions. I, I think I'll, I'll end with a couple other items. Again, one which you can read in depth, and that's uh, our collaborative report with the National Governors Association, our call to action called "Stronger Together." And this was specifically addressing uh, the 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 work of this task force, so to speak, a couple of years ago. So we had we've had a lot of conversations over the last four or five years about how state governments can assist uh, local governments in this space and uh, basically determined we needed a stronger uh, set of advocacy uh, points around that as well as specifics. And so we collaborated with National Governors Association on this report. And it's really about the, you know, again, the theme of your task force, which is 
uh, what, what can states do? And this was uh, outlining uh, a series of what states have already done. So in uh, both throughout this report, as well as uh, in, in, the, uh, in the appendix, you have examples of what states have done to assist local governments in a wide variety of, uh, of situations. And again, then we, I'm not gonna go through the various recommendations here, but you can see we have three major recommendations. And you know, part of that is that uh, there is not a strong, in, in most states, if you saw from the data, almost three quarters of the states, there's not a pre-existing relationship around what states can do for locals in the cyberspace. So again, using the League of Cities, using the Association of Counties, League of Municipalities, whatever group, starting with those broad groups, which many states have, have begun, and speaking to them, working with their, um, uh, their leadership, is, uh, is very important to begin that conversation because certainly don't believe it's possible for the states to do one-on-one -on -one technical assistance or to reach out to each individual city, county, township, borough, whatever state you're in. I mean, that's just, we know that's not feasible, but there can things can be done by building through uh, those associations. And the other part of that is very few states spend any time on, uh, I would call kind of the, the marketing or the level of awareness. So most our, our discussions with local governments and the local government associations at the national level, many of them said, we don't know our state CIO organization. We don't know what capabilities and services and disciplines they have because they don't communicate with us. We have no relationship with them. Um, and so, you know, a, a formal awareness and marketing campaign would be helpful. Uh, and again, states might have uh, 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 contractors, might have third parties on contract. Uh, that would be more than willing to supply services to local governments if the locals even knew about it. And the third part of that, of course, is the, the cost savings. And that's basically, you know, as you've heard, it's, that's the anchor tenant model. That's leveraging the power of the state government in their buying power and leveraging in their procurements to extend those contracts and those master price contracts and opportunities to local governments and their solicitations. So as they put out new solicitations for pick one, cybersecurity awareness modules for the executive branch, uh, could that be made available to local jurisdictions? That would drive their costs down on a per unit basis and make them customers. And again, a number of states have done that. Uh, they've done it through uh, products that do things like fishing exercises. They've extended that, again, that contract to local governments and letting them procure that and become part of that, uh, that overall universe of uh, in, in from their supplier community to their user base. So I think there's a number of things that states, you know, states can do. Um, you know, some states have actually moved into assessments where they're actually providing capabilities to assess and come in and do a assessment and provide an after action report to local government saying, here are areas you need to address. Here's, here's remediation. We see weaknesses across the board. It may be pen testing. It may be actually, you know, on the ground. Uh, the National Guard has been used in many states to conduct these activities. And you know, so some of the things you may be already doing in, in Kansas, because I'm not aware of all those, but that's certainly a range of things that can be done. Uh, Michigan started the CISO as a service program, which uses um, uh, chief information security officers from local governments that uh, receive additional training and then are used to go out and help their, their peers, help their brethren. Uh, that, you know, because if you look at the range of, of cities and counties within the state, I suspect the overall majority of them are not going to have a full-time security person, and they probably may not even have an IT director or CIO except for the large jurisdiction. So we understand that. So, you know, how can you, how can you, uh, you know, have those things and created these, I guess, pooling opportunities around that. So many states have begun that process. Uh, to increase the maturity of their uh, of their local government uh, jurisdictions, so that's an important thing to do as you talk about collaboration. And you've mentioned a number of these things in your list of of objectives here, so I don't need to to belabor that. But I think you know, looking at this report and seeing examples of what some states have done, including you know, holding annual cybersecurity summits and conferences, and making sure local governments are an active uh, an active part of that that conversation. And again, this. This is not strictly from the office of the CIO or CISO, but you have this broad stakeholder engagement around the state with the National Guard, with uh, the emergency management, with law enforcement, the state police, others. You have the Fusion Center. They're involved in activities in many states around cybercrime and intelligence sharing. Uh, all of these are, are players, so to speak. It's, it's a team sport. It's a 
are players in this because it's you know, no longer should be constrained to simply this is an IT business problem. It's got to be much, uh, much broader than that. So let me end with uh, some of the things that certainly we're, we're seeing in terms of uh, that highlight this, uh, some of the state uh, kind of cyber trends to keep an eye on. I was just did a briefing, a uh, national briefing about three weeks ago for, for uh, National Associations of Attorneys General for, for NAG. Uh, and uh, we talked about some of these, uh, some of these trends. So I'm going to kind of use this again as, we look at the data we're getting from our most recent reports, and as we look, we go to our state CISOs and say, rank order what you're going to look at in a, in a high priority in a, in a kind of a post-pandemic world. I'm um, probably using that phrase too early, but that's uh, kind of what we what we looked at. And you can see I've highlighted a few, but you know certainly a big part of that's going to be sustaining remote work and how do you continue to secure that. Uh, but certainly the discussion around uh, broader whole estate, um, looking at um, adopting a zero trust framework. We have a number of states that have already gone down that path. Uh, but I think for you all, you know, part of that is just both from state government and from a local government perspective, how can you promote securing uh, the digital services channels? How do you have, uh, you know, a secure opportunity for online digital uh, services for all citizens? And part of that is, again, a robust identity and access management, identity verification, digital credentials, uh, states are, are doing that across the board. From the task force's perspective, one thing obviously is, is, is looking at the environment around local governments is uh, promoting and endorsing, uh, assisting in the adoption of a .gov domain for all locals. That's been, been one of NACIO's advocacy items uh, for over uh, 10 years. Uh, we work closely with, uh, with the authors of uh, the .gov domain bill uh, and also with CISA uh, to have the .gov registration and administration moved into uh, CISA, into DHS and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency. Uh, and I think you know, most importantly, uh, you know, last April, uh, CISA announced that they had removed the, what we believe was the showstop, the barrier of the $400 registration fee for .gov. Um, so there's certainly more technical issues around that, but if you look across the the landscape of local governments, 90% across the country are not, 90% are not using .gov. And uh, we believe it's, it's important to move local governments into the domain that's secure, that's trusted, that actually reflects their organizational entity and can obviously then expose that to citizens who should understand that they should only do business with, with organizations uh, at the local level that have a .gov domain. So that's an area that we are gonna continue to work on. We've been talking with our counterparts at the national level that represent cities and counties and uh, have regular sync ups with them about this. There's a lot of trepidation around this. There's a lot of concern about uh, state, this local governments that believe that their citizens are gonna be confused. Uh, you know, quite frankly, having been involved in that in my career, uh, I, it, it's going to take some time. It's change management. There's a, a cultural and organizational resistance to change more than there is the reality of um, moving to .gov. In fact, this long term is the right thing and the most beneficial thing to do. So there's, there's one kind of early action item from the state government side is how can, what can we do to facilitate and enable and support the transition for our local jurisdictions uh, to .gov? Um, and get them off this kind of crazy quilt of all these domain names uh, that quite frankly do not represent the organization and confuse the citizens. I think this is particularly critical in the election space. Um, and that's something that's not under the purview or authority of the state CIO, but we've been working with our, our strategic partners in this space. And now that the registration fee cost, that barrier has been removed, which we believe was significant. Uh, I, I, this is a 10 year journey. Quite frankly, I think it's going to take a while, but I think it's a, it's the right thing to begin messaging in terms of uh, the security posture of our of our local government. So, with uh, with that, uh, I think I will end, and and uh, we can move on. I'll take questions uh, if you have any, and again, uh, just highlight the fact that you can uh, you can download any of these reports digitally, including our our most recent one on business relationship management. And I put that in there simply because it discusses the broader ecosystem of what the state CR organizations are seeing, which is uh, this, this ecosystem, which includes local government. So as many states begin to move out of the 100% kind of owner-operator model, 
and begin to you know look at uh, their, their shared responsibility with their private sector uh, partners in delivering uh, and supporting IT services uh, throughout their states. Uh, we see local governments as part of that BRM ecosystem because they're, they're going to be perhaps dealing with the CIO organization. And as you saw from the, that first set of data points about how many of them are providing uh, services across the board uh, to your local governments. So uh, we, see, we see that uh, perhaps growing because the, the, the resources and the capabilities of the local governments, uh, quite frankly, in many cases are declining. Uh, they can't retain those folks. And so we see that as a significant uh, risk factor uh, across the board about what, uh, you know, and I'm, what I'm talking about is clearly the, the overwhelming majority of the, the uh, cities and counties that are not urban metropolitan areas that have a, that are really struggling with uh, what they're going to do in their, in the future for their information technology uh, support services. So just some, just some thoughts there, but a big part of that is getting them to understand that, that cybersecurity is not relegated to the back office IT shop no longer can have that uh, perspective. I'm done preaching the gospel questions. <laughs> so Doug, thank you for the, over, the overview. There was a lot of important information and context, as well as a, a bunch of great ideas for us to consider as part of our work. Sure. Uh, and, and so we'll open up to the, to the committee. Does anyone have any follow-up questions for, for Doug? I do, Doug. Are you seeing a lot of states, you know, kind of take that, you know, that is one of our challenges is communicating out with the localities. Are you seeing them start dedicating staff to those efforts or how are they kind of tackling that challenge? Uh, I, yes, in some states, Jeff, they are dedicating staff, uh, but others it's just a, um, I think, a, a shift or simply a reallocation and recognizing that they, they have this broader role. So whether it might be, for example, uh, coordinating with the National Guard to have the Guard provide, go out and actually do, a number of states, the Guard actually is going out to counties and doing a cyber assessment. So they're, they're sending the Guard out to do risk assessments. So it's just, again, putting a portfolio of that, because you're right, they're not gonna have the, uh, the capabilities. It, it, perhaps it could be uh, the, the state CISO or others uh, and, and again, I think it's it's quite frankly easier to do today in a virtual setting for those that can 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 use that is to be able to uh, articulate what I just did, but do it for the local governments on a broader construct. But uh, again, states have have uh, a number of states have been doing cyber summits uh, up until you know, we couldn't meet in person, um, and and they're inviting their local government constituencies to come listen to a series of uh, perhaps you know presentations around that. And I think this is going to be, I think the time now is more critical than ever for one reason, and that is uh, we fully expect the cyber, state and local cyber uh, improvement component of the infrastructure bill. You know, we, we worked with the House two years ago and that was introduced but never passed the Senate. So now the Senate has moved that and increased it and actually doubled the amount and it's part of the, the current uh, Senate bill. Uh, I think we're going to see a, a substantial increase because now you have a billion dollars on the table over four years. 80% of that is going to go to local governments. So the state of Kansas is going to get their allocation based on the, uh, the uh, allotment. They're going to get their allocation and they're going to be then working with, uh, you know, under that FEMA guidance to provide grants to local governments for exclusively for cybersecurity for a four-year period. Oh, again, a billion dollars starting with 500 million in year one. I, NASIO is an association in my leadership, and, and quite frankly, I am very concerned about the fact that many of these local jurisdictions are not prepared to make wise decisions about how they're going to use those funds. I think it's a great opportunity for the states, and we're going to be working on some of the recommendations and guidance, for the states to immediately begin messaging that we're prepared, for example, to provide you know, enterprise-wide uh, cybersecurity training and awareness out of our state contract. We're going to increase the licenses and you can now, you know, for, for dollars a, a year, be able to use this as opposed to a hundred different cities and counties all going out and buying that. They're, 
I can tell you based on my conversations and, and uh, things that I'm hearing from the marketplace, I am very concerned. Local governments are going to be assailed with all of these opportunities from the provider community. And I'm very concerned that they will not choose wisely, uh, that they are going to make uh, decisions based on you know, a lot of information that they're pressured to say, we need to spend this money. So we need to you know, replace our firewall environment. Uh, and, and do things that are just simply to spend these dollars. So I think the importance now in messaging and marketing is, is going to be really critical over the next, uh, it's going to take a few months to stand up. So obviously we anticipate the infrastructure bill to pass, let's say early October. It's going to take a few months for CISA to begin to build up the, uh, they're going to have to write the guidance and then they're going to have to obviously disperse the funds. Uh, so it's going to be a while. We think this is that, ripe opportunity for states to begin to think about, you know, in addition to providing services under this kind of contract and leverage model, what else can they do? And part of it may be to direct some of the funds that the states get to use to your point, which is, you know, maybe dedicated to the folks that are doing that. There are, you know, this, so, so DHS has, you know, cyber advisors in many states uh, the cyber navigator program is being used in many states on the election side because, again, elections are local and you need that assistance at the local level. But you know, there is just not enough bodies and resources and expertise in any state, quite frankly, to help the local government. So it's got to be kind of a, a broad based approach. And uh, again, beginning, we believe beginning at the macro level with the associations um, as an arm to get to their members and to speak at their events is an effective kind of first step. One-on-one uh, -on -one assistance is stopgap. So I don't think it's, I don't think states can get in that, in that area unless they want to get into actual recovery and, and remediation services. So just a, uh, just a note on the, uh, at least from the local level, I mean, we got a .gov domain early on. Uh, there are times recently when I'm, um, I don't know that I'm really thrilled about the fact that we have a .gov domain simply because it, it, it makes us a target. Um, so there may be some logic in, in some of these smaller entities <clears throat> that don't have IT presence um, that they maybe wait until we have something that's a little more uh, constructed for them to, to protect themselves before we make them a target by getting a, a .gov domain. I mean, that's just, that's kind of just my two cents, but I know that that um, uh, we started out as a .org early 2000, I think, and then got a .gov. And of course at the time that wasn't a big deal, but now, uh, now that's changed. So just, I, I think that that might be um, something that, that you know, we take into consideration, but Jeff and I have talked quite a bit about, you know, this idea of how we incorporate the, at least from, like from my perspective, the Derby and Goddard and, right, these smaller communities that don't have, either don't have any IT at all, or they have one, a one-man shop that kind of does everything. Uh, and, you know, how do we, how do we provide them with, we were fortunate enough to get CISA to do a, a uh, review of our infrastructure and probably one of the best reports that we've gotten. Um, so, um, you know, I think that that arm in the federal government being staffed up a little bit uh, because two years ago, they told us it would be two years before they could even get to us. So um, I think there are some changes, at least at the federal level that could be a, of assistance as well. Yes, and they, uh, they are staffing up by the way. Um, so that's, uh, that's definitely, uh, that's definitely something that, uh, that's, that's definitely something that we are seeing, uh, is their capability is going to continue to grow even in that .gov. And there's certainly, uh, some, uh, support for your, your comment about .gov being a target, but given the fact that the administration, the .gov route, uh, and the security of that, you know, obviously far exceed just the, just the process of vetting, uh, and attribution and requirements to get a .gov domain. You know, it's not, you know, 995 online. Uh, it's a, a more rigorous capability and, and vetting process to do that. And I think that uh, you can 
you know, I think the users could be assured that that is a legitimate domain. Does it present opportunities for, you know, for attacks from criminals and nation states? It certainly does. I'm not sure there's any data that I have seen uh, that uh, supports that. You, it makes it makes the makes it a greater target. We'd have I'd have to go to uh, to CISA to see that. You know, we we you know, we've heard anecdotal, but again across the board, not anything that that indicates that. Uh, there are other clearly indicators. I mean, the state of Washington has many more attacks uh, because people believe that they are attacking Washington D.C. So that's one. That's not anecdotal. That's that's data. But I think they're. You know, that's some of the things that we have seen over the over the years. Um, I think the other question, and this is, you know, I, I would maybe call it heresy for some of the local governments. The other question on the table when you talk about supporting local IT and some of my uh, colleagues have actually um, kind of put out statements is 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 fundamentally should, even, should that local government even be involved in in supporting local IT services, given the the, the challenges we have around uh, risk and cybersecurity and sustainability and having, you know, one person supporting that. And, you know, that's kind of a question on the table is, is, you know, not simply saying, how do you support those people? But fundamentally asking the question is, uh, should that unit of government even be in, in providing any IT services or should it all be outsourced? Should it be provided by, you know, can the states do that? Because states are doing that for a number of, of jurisdictions. Um, but, you know, again, that's a that's a huge change management uh, component. But I think we're going to see more and more locals look at that and say, uh, you know, we, we need to rethink this model. And the model might be we don't need to be in the IT business at all. That's not a core competency. We can't support it. We can't retain the professionals. We've got people retiring. So that's a bigger question on the table. But I think uh, we certainly there certainly are states that have had that conversation. And we've seen states move in that direction where. Uh, we've got two states now that are in a full, you know, multi-supplier integration model with towers where the state as an entity um, is outsourced almost all of their, their IT core services, both from the data center network and the side uh, applications uh, development may still take place at the agency level. Uh, but the, uh, and we're going to see, I think we're going to see more and more of that in the future a state struggle, particularly with the capital expense to upgrade their environment. It's, you know, it's just it, for, for them from a business side, it just makes more sense. So that's again, a fundamental shift, but we've seen the data over the last 10 years, which that's the way the CIO organizations are projecting. They're going to move. It's much, it's, you know, more cloud, more SaaS, more off-premise. I have two CIOs right now that are talking about outsourcing their entire data center. Uh, they don't. They no longer believe they can support and modernize the environment, so they want to get out of the data center business and basically have it run under contract with uh, most of it in the cloud. So, you know, this is what the private sector has done in many instances. State governments are are facing that same dilemma over the next few years. So, Doug, as as a follow up to that, it it almost feels like um, kind of that private centralized enterprise IT model is, is what you're describing, right? So um, the state might then become kind of that central IT component that then provides all those services to the local local agency level. Um, so I, I find that an interesting concept. Uh, Mike, it, it, I wanted to make sure it looked like maybe you had a follow-up question. Well, I just, you, you, you're, you're never gonna get local. I mean, come in, I've been in local government for a long time. You're never going to get local government completely out because they they're the only ones that understand their data. So I mean, they ha you have to partner with them at some level, right, to engage them in this process. So you know, to, to suggest that you're just going to outsource it all, I mean, I, I've always had a big issue with everybody that says I have a cloud strategy because yeah, that works well for the vendors because they make more money. But, but yeah, I'll put stuff in the cloud when it makes business sense, but I'm not going to throw every cloud just because somebody tells me I should. Uh, if it makes sense, I will. But if it doesn't, then I won't. And, you know, we're still looking at, <clears throat> we still do some storage on-prem because it's cheaper. 
um, quite frankly. So I, you know, I just, I, I think we have to be pragmatic in terms of, of, uh, or not, I think we have to be careful about making just overarching, you know, this is, this is what's going to happen. We have to, that's part of why we have this task force. We need to understand, right, what's going to work in the state of Kansas and how can we make sure that we provide the level of, of security that's needed, you know, across the, <clears throat> across the state. So that, I, I just. <clears throat> you know, yeah, Mike, I, Mike, I would agree with you. And my comment uh, is always, if you've seen one state, you've seen one state. Uh, my generalization was on trending. It wasn't on, I'm not predicting the future. I was saying we have the data to support uh, the continued move to uh, state CIO as broker model. So again, a, you know, it's not abandoning the 100% the, the owner operator model, but it's been an evolution over time. And there are a number of states that are already there uh, that operate this model with uh, you know, fixed towers uh, of services that are all done by best of breed providers under a competitive solicitation and a multi-year agreement. And, um, you know, they, they, have, they have done this already. So it's, it's not a theoretical discussion. It's the, it's the evolution we're seeing over what the, you know, what, what the path has been over the last decade of this growth from, when you look at what states did 10 years ago, uh, to to how are they going to service their environment from a state CO perspective? It was to expand or remediate their data center and hire more state IT staff. Okay, those are the those are I only know of one state that is actually doing that today in terms of a data center. Those are those are that's in the opposite direction of where we are today. States are not hiring more IT staff, uh, and they're not remediating and building new data centers. They're, if anything, they're reducing their footprint. They are closing and moving to different environments, and they are looking to uh, long-term partnerships and engagements. And they certainly have the same issue about knowing their data at, a, at an expansive level, uh, much more expansive than local governments, and challenging that. So it is, it is not, a, it's not a theoretical discussion or trying to predict that. It's what's happening on the ground today. And a big part of that are just the general forces of change and one is the inability to get the appropriate capital to modernize the environment. So you certainly heard during the pandemic enough about the need for legacy and, and, and uh, infrastructure modernization uh, and the states you know, have that at a, at a level. So I'm just, I'm being more descriptive than I am predictive about what's going on. Yeah, and, and, and I, I, I'm not trying to be argumentative. I just, you know, I, you see the same thing in the private sector. Yeah. Um, and it's, so it's, it's, it's not that much different, but I, but I think that the big difference is you've got funding capabilities in the private sector that you quite frankly, just don't have in the, in the public sector. Right. And, and uh, hopefully <clears throat> I won't, uh, I won't get kicked off the, the task force, but I don't know that using state government is, is, uh, in many cases is a best practice example. Um, I mean, I've seen some things that our that our state has done in the past um, that was uh, questionable at best in terms of, of how we how we spent and 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 what they did. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I, I don't. You get the larger you get, sometimes the the, the more challenging it is to. Uh, uh, how should I put this? Uh, to do the right things, so to speak. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I just, you know, I, and I'm not suggesting that people at the local level or the, you know, cats meow. Um, of course, I've also heard that that phrase is no longer used and I should quit saying it. My two daughters have told me that I'm, you know, they don't even know what that means. Um, but, uh, um, I, you know, I, I, I think that again, it's, it's that how do, we, how do we take those best practices across all the entities and, and look at, at, you know, what makes sense um, on the ground um, and in the, in the practical sense. And I get, I mean, right, you, you've got a lot of data and, and that's of, uh, uh, certainly of, of high value. Um, and, and yeah, it's, you know, if I could 
predict the future, I probably wouldn't be working for the city. Right. Yeah. Same, same, uh, same here. I'd be, uh, you put my money down on some NFL games, right? Uh, if you knew that. So I, I think to, to your point, I agree. And I, I'm not describing uh, what necessarily might be a best practice. I'm just giving you examples, um, you know, with certainly with, with, uh, without, without commentary about where, where states are going. But I think the question for you all in the task force is really does the, um, does the state, you know, what is, what is the state's position or, or, you know, obligation, if they might think they have an obligation, you have this, obviously the subcommittee to look at coordination and collaboration. And I think that's the real question is what's, what does the state see? There are many states that have seen their role to be kind of a leader in this space. We have lots of examples. I, again, I would, would urge you to look at the call to action, the, call, the stronger together, where we point out what states are doing. And many of them have extended uh, their services or look for opportunities to engage local governments because they know uh, for the most part, if you look at, again, the most jurisdictions are under 3,000 population in the U.S., that they have, you know, they are at risk and they have a need and they don't have the existing resources. So what can the state do? And, it, and, it, and, and if you see the numbers from the survey, clearly uh, many states have not seen it as their prerogative or their, uh, they don't see that from the CIO perspective. They don't see that as part of their portfolio. They don't see it as their priority to be in the in the education and advocacy and helping local governments because they've got enough on their plate just dealing with state agencies. Uh, others have set, you know, have set a different approach and have really set out to, um, to really try to educate and advocate and provide a, a portfolio of services that, that local governments can take advantage of. So I think that's what you all have to work through is, like I said, every state's gonna be different in what, uh, in, in what they're, how they're gonna approach this and what they're gonna do. But there's some, again, some opportunities coming up with this uh, potential funding that, uh, you know, I think you have to look at that as a, as, as a way to make sure that uh, you can, you know, get that foundation uh, kind of constructed to uh, do that. And it may be nothing more than education. You know, it doesn't have to be services. It could be simply uh, educating and it could be in concert with local leaders uh, to get that out there, so. Uh, I uh, need, to, I've got about five minutes before I need to run to another appointment here. Uh, any more questions for me? I've got a quick one, Doug, real quickly with that. Yeah. The, the grant you're talking about, the cybersecurity specifically, do you know if that's going to be ran through the state Homeland Security Advisors, like the, the uh, Homeland Security Grant Program, or is that going to be ran through a different avenue? Well, uh, you know, Jeff, to be determined, uh, it, okay. it CISA, CISA was directed, original language uh, a year and more ago was that that would be run through CISA, but that's been altered. And now it's going to run, not only the amount went from 500 to a billion, uh, it's now going to be run through FEMA, uh, very much like State Homeland Security Grant, the SHISGAP model, uh, with um, uh, a, a, comp a competitive program for locals, but basically the 80-20, so very mm -hmm. similar to that, where 80% of the dollars and it's going to be dedicated to cybersecurity. 80% of it's going to go to local governments. Uh, how that will come out in the wash in the next month, it could be um, the it, it could be um, Homeland Security. It could be the CIO office. I suspect that's not the case. CIO offices don't have a lot of history or, or track record in being grant recipients and managing uh, grants. Uh, but the CIO organization is going to have authority over the over the process, so to speak. So it's uh, it's probably going to use the existing mechanisms uh, in place um, to administer the grants and provide that. You know, our position was CIO organizations aren't really staffed up or qualified to do grant administration and grant disbursements. It's there's already a mechanism to do that. This just has a you know much larger number. So uh, you know, states, you know, smaller states are going to be getting you know eight to ten million, fifteen million. I can't predict what, what Kansas is going to get, you know, but if you kind of look at the distribution model, but again, that's over four years. But I think it's a great opportunity for the state. We've been already had these discussions internally uh, and ASIO is a great opportunity for the states to look at these and say, well, we already have a platform for, you know, whatever, uh, security training. We have, we have an enterprise contract for security training for all, uh, you know, folks in the executive branch. And we could extend that to local government so that you had 
of, you know, a high quality consistency of training. And it could be a collaboration or it could just be an offering where they just say, we're going to offer this up. You can do whatever you want, but you know, we can give you this for, you know, pennies on the dollar compared to if you have every little jurisdiction doing that. And that's been the model Pennsylvania and others have already used in the past. Um, so that's a good, good example of how you can use the state, you know, kind of buying power to do that. And there may be others where you, you have approved products, you know, you have, you have approved products, whether it's software, hardware on the cybersecurity thing on the, on the list and you make that available to, uh, to them because I, quite frankly, I'm concerned more that it's going to be just a feeding frenzy and uh, there's just going to be, you know, so many suppliers and products available that it, you know, it may end up, you know, not being what we really need in terms of everybody out there just, Mm -hmm. you you know, use their funds to procure everything. So something you all should think about in terms of this, because if it's clearly coming down the tracks, I think we're fairly confident that the language is you know, based on our communications and everything else, that that language is going to stick. It is, you know, you look at the, 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 the money in the, uh, in the infrastructure bill, 1.9 trillion broadband alone is 65 billion. We're talking about $1 billion for cybersecurity state and local. That's a rounding error in, in, in the bill. Right. So, we don't believe they're going to spend a lot of time changing that. I'm not so, <laughs> just, a, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. I'm, we're aspirational that it's going to stay. So. Oh, thank so, you for that. So Doug, we know you got to run. Uh, this has been yes. really great having you here and, and sharing yes. your thoughts with us. Uh, thank you so much. And totally. um, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Yeah. Oh, thank you, John. Glad to be here and so, certainly follow up, go through Allie. If you've got any follow up questions and I'm going to send her the deck so you'll have, you can share this. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you all. Bye. Have a good day. You too. All right. Well, that was exciting. Lots of great conversation. Thanks for the great questions. So for our next uh, part of our discussion this morning, um, uh, it's going to be more open discussion with just, uh, just us. And um, I have some questions prepared, maybe to kick off some conversation. And then as we get closer uh, to the end, uh, we'll start to focus on uh, what's next. Maybe if there's other resources or individuals or data or, or groups or folks that we need to um, think about having come and, and brief us or, or work with us, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that there towards the end before we wrap up. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about, and I know we ran out of time with Doug, but um, I think it was what Mike was talking about is the idea of best practices and and how do we, how do we share those best practices? How do we get best practices out to the, to the various areas in the state? And uh, one of the questions I had in my mind about this was would a peer assessor model work, right? Is there a way that um, maybe some of the lean forward agencies or state or local in the state could could be used to to go out and help others or alternatively are there other states that are maybe a little more lean forward that that could come out and kind of assess or help with assessing um, and assess in the sense of like current state evaluation and then also uh, identification of best practices and next steps so I don't know if that makes sense or maybe I'm just crazy with this with this thought but um, you know maybe maybe back to you for Mike for a moment and see what you think about that concept. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I think it's, I think it's good. I, I, I think having a, and I don't know, I post this back out um, to this committee. Um, <clears throat> having, having a, uh, I hate to say, but having an Excel that, that tells us what, what uh, local governments even have IT, um, Right. At, at what point <clears throat> it might be a size thing, it might be a money thing, but at what point finding out, right, what what local governments have, what do they have? So it's kind of like doing an inventory. So we know, right, is there at what level do they need assistance? Um, is, it, is it we need to assist with an IT, you know, helping their IT department or they don't have any IT department. So then it's it's talking about um, as actually as Doug kind of talked about on the earlier earlier um, task force, 
talked about, you know, this is not a, a IT issue. It's a business issue. And so at, at, at that, with those local folks, we'd be talking about, uh, uh, you know, to their uh, council or their mayor or right, then it's different entities that we're having discussions with. But I, I don't know how Jeff feels about it, but I'm, my take on it would be, you know, the first thing is to figure out who we need to talk to and, and you know, and at what level. And then, it, so it's kind of, kind of having an inventory of, of what exists, you know, within the state. Um, and that's just local government, not even getting into the, the private sector and, you know, the, the expanded reach that, that we're kind of talking about. But, and, and same, uh, same kind of with you, John, is, is, you know, what, are there local uh, hospitals that, that, you know, more likely they're going to have IT. Um, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't think, and you would know this, but I wouldn't think there's any that, that don't have some type of IT presence. It may be outsourced, but, but uh, I would think most of those. But I, I think, long-winded, I think that that's where we start. Okay. And, and I think that's a natural maybe segue to this broader question, which is there may already be a bunch of great things happening in the state. Right. I, I think there are a lot of positive things. So how do we how do we identify those to your point about inventory? Uh, but then secondly, how do we leverage or build upon those? And, and I think this is a question for the group. Like, you know, what are we thinking about um, uh, about inventory of good things or best practice? How do we identify those? What do we do with those? Where does that fit? And I think that's been one of the biggest challenges and just building those collaboration paths so we can identify what folks can do and what they can't do or where those are and what people perceive as their, their lanes of responsibility. Um, you know, there's some that have it, you know, legislative mandate, what their authority is and what they can do and can't do. But, you know, in a lot of the space, you know, all the stakeholders here have some, some level of authority in, in certain cyber lanes, but we've just never really started talking together in kind of this collaborative fashion. And then, take that down to the next level is okay. Now whole of state beyond just state government. I think that's one of the key cruxes to, to any direction forward. I'd like to draw sort of a comparison with uh, municipal courts because every city in this state, well, I shouldn't say every city, but almost every city in this state has a municipal court. Now they may meet daily or they may meet once a year Back in uh, 1989, legislation was finally passed uh, that would require judges to get training. It was a multi-year task, actually, that the Kansas Municipal Judges Association took on because what we saw was some courts acted like, you got a ticket, you're guilty, which clearly was not appropriate. So they didn't have the requisite training to be judges. Why am I talking about this? Because I see the same thing with IT. It's my belief that every single city in this state has IT. Now, it may be something really expansive like the city of Wichita would have or, or Kansas City or Topeka, or it may be something like a town of uh, 500 that I'm aware of that they have one computer that's hooked up to the internet and they have uh, McAfee on it and they think that's good. And I'm not saying it's bad, but when I talk to them as a corporation commissioner and their utilities, they had no clue that they could possibly be a doorway into some other entities like Evergy. So I think a couple of things. One is we're talking about training at the local level, but Mike makes a good point. We don't know what's out there and we don't know how much training people need. So what the Municipal Judges Association did was it worked with legislators in order to provide a mechanism that ultimately required 
cities, if they wanted to have a court, they had to have judges who were educated. Now, I'm not sure exactly how you would do that in IT, but something along the lines of, well, if you wanna be hooked up to the state services, whatever those may be, then you would have to show some core competencies, uh, competencies, uh, and that would be training. So the Kansas Municipal Judges Association was involved, the Judicial Council was involved, the League of Municipalities was involved. And in, in this instance, I could see the League being a, a key player here uh, because most of the cities and, and towns in Kansas participate with the league. I don't, not all of them, but most of them do. And I, uh, I kind of think that there's also an attitude among the cities that, well, yeah, you're from the government and I'm from the government, but I'm not sure you're here to help me because you're big government and, and I want to handle it here by myself. That was one of the things we had to overcome in order to get municipal judges educated. And I think we're looking at the same thing here. We have got to overcome the attitude that just because the legislature may have uh, passed some legislation that requires a certain amount of training in order to get certain benefits, uh, it's not a bad thing. Uh, one of the things that Doug talked about, of course, was the grant that's coming down the road. I don't know what uh, uh, restrictions, if you will, or, or carrots we could put with that, but if there would be some way to not have the same debacle that occurred with the earlier Homeland Security grant funds where it was an 80-20 split and we have... Um, vehicles sitting parked all around the state that have never been driven once, uh, but they sure are neat to have in the garage uh, because that 20, that 80 percent went to the locals. If we had been able to put some restrictions or caveats or whatever you want to call them onto that uh, 80 percent, then maybe we could have really had a very beneficial program uh, with those Homeland Security dollars. I don't know, uh, and I, none of us know, I'm sure exactly how that's gonna come out, but if we could somehow um, have a more informed way to spend that 80% on the part of the locals, part of which would be training, then I think we could really benefit statewide. Sorry, long-winded, but, but I just saw a really clear correlation between what we did in the 1980s with municipal judges and what we can now do with the IT people, because I guarantee you, most municipal judges in the state are not full-time. Some of them, as I said, only sit once a month or once every couple of months, whenever there's a case. That doesn't mean they don't need the same kind of training as the Wichita judges who sit every single day. I'll shut up now. Uh, and, and we're seeing actually a trend, I think, is it the state of Texas that has mandated through legislation that all government employees must take security awareness training and that's local and state level. Um, you know, so there are some states that are definitely taking that approach um, to ensure that their localities are, are, are getting there. And there's, you know, to the point of, you know, whatever we come out with the FEMA grant, I mean, I think that's going to be a huge piece in, you know, that communication, coordination, collaboration, because I think the ultimate goal from, uh, you know, what we like to see is how best can we maximize all those dollars across the board, um, whether it's, it's, you know, the state contributing to help out as well with its shares and things like that. Um, but it has to be in that kind of coordinated effort on what to spend the money on and where it probably has the biggest impact. And that's, again, I think, how do we communicate with those leagues and associations and then bring in the stakeholders like Mike, um, you know, across the state um, to engage in those conversations? I think that's one of the biggest challenges we're going to face. Um, and hopefully out of this task force here, we can start building some of those bridges, I hope. 
this is this is Bill, and I, I do have a comment on on this. Um, one of the things I've seen as I've worked with Homeland Security grant money uh, is uh, just the fact that it's part of Homeland Security and FEMA. Uh, they require that that money to be spent across the what is it, 17 sectors, and so I know that we are looking at 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 uh, um, at, at uh, um, government, um, uh, the state of Kansas. Uh, cybersecurity um, items, uh, but in the context of that grant money, uh, I think it expands the conversation to all of critical infrastructure and those various sectors out in the rural areas of Kansas, whether it be water or power or telecom or, or any of the other, or, 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 or med- medicine, they're, they're all hurting in the same way in terms of not having resources. And so I think we might want to take a look at, at maybe um, um, uh, collectively uh, looking for collective solutions because um, collectively they may carry more weight than, than individually, and we may get even more bang for the buck if, if we do that. And hopefully that's making sense. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's really what I was thinking too, in terms of, of looking at, you know, like anything else, even though that's a lot of money, if we take it as a collaborative and and take an overall approach and prioritize um, and then use it that way, then it's, to me, that makes a lot more sense. So you're, you're, you know, it's, it's, as, as Jeff kind of talked about, right, that, that centralized model, it is more, it is more efficient because you can gain economies of scale. And so, you know, looking at being able to deliver out either training or hardware or software or right, right, whatever it might be, but target those high value um, entities, right? It's, it's kind of like, Jeff, it's kind of like doing a risk assessment, yep. doing it at a, at a state level and saying, okay, what, where where are our prime targets? What do we need to protect first? And then work our way down from there. And I think the biggest piece, you know, what this specific subcommittee is, how do we start building those inroads for communication and getting that that level of collaboration? Because, you know, in our, our today's environment, it's only taking place at, at kind of a, a limited scope. And so what do we need to do to get to that larger collaborative scope? So I think that uh, a lot of uh, organizations, especially the very small ones, aren't even aware of the risk at hand. And so as we've discussed earlier, the first step is education. And so we somehow have to get that, that message out to them as to what, what place they have in, in the risk. Uh, but with that in mind, we also need to be planning for the next step, which is self-assessment that once they're educated to the risk, then we need to teach them how to do a self-assessment to evaluate their, their overall maturity, finding gaps in that maturity, and then, and then uh, investing their, limit, their scarce security dollars to close those gaps as they can. So I think those are all Great ideas. I, Jeff, to your point about how do we start that collaboration? How do we start that communication? You know, I, I it, because I think that's, that's maybe even the first step before we begin some education, right? We got to start letting people know what we're trying to do, where they fit, why they matter, what we need their help with, right? So how do we even begin that part? Like, how do we bring people together? What's the right way to try and message things? How do we how do we get the messaging out? How do we bring people together that want to collaborate on these things? I mean, uh, I don't know if it's true that all, all local governments are excited and interested in participating in cyber stuff. Um, you know, I know cyber excites me, but I don't know if it excites everyone else the same way. And so like, how do we start some of that collaboration? How do we bring the people together? How do we start having those conversations? Yeah, and I can I can tell you, John. I mean that this is certainly not my bailiwick, which is I'm sure why nobody put, actually put me on this committee. Um, but the you've got some entities that aren't even thinking about it, 
right? Uh, my wife's from Mount Ridge, Kansas, and cybersecurity is not even on their radar, right? We're so little, nobody cares about us. We're, we're immune is, is the thinking. And so, you know, I think part of it is just a kind of a campaign, if you will, that, that you know, this is, it's a, it's a big issue. It's a business issue. You, you have to have seen it, right? But that's, I think that's part of what we'll have to deal with or this team will, or this committee will have to deal with is that, that concept, right? That, no, they only go after Wichita or they only go after, right? We don't have anything that they want here or they just don't really think about it. I'd like to tag on to that and uh, starting out with the notion that birds of a feather flock together and every single entity in, in any of those sectors out there, whether it be cities or counties or, or um, um, electricity or water, they all have associations that they, that they belong to um, of, of other like companies and they periodically get together to talk about their issues. I think that uh, as we put this together, I think we need to, to identify those associations and then we need to endeavor to go to those those periodic meetings and and implement the campaign that Mike talked about at those at those meetings to educate them that they need to be educated, uh, so to speak. So I, I think that's a great point. You know, is is that something we did need to think about if we could identify one or two and maybe have them come speak to us about what might work if we were to go that, that approach? Is that something this group is thinking of? Or um, do we need to think about that down the road? No, I think that would probably be a good start. Um, you know, and a couple of big ones right off the bat, you know, the League of Municipalities here in Kansas or the Association of Counties um, would be one. And I know obviously, you know, the energy groups and even the, what was another group I just stumbled across? It's the, uh, the regulators utilities type thing has their own little uh you know collective as well that that can be leaned into as well um that kind of operate at a different level than just the, the traditional cities and counties and things like that so i think there are a lot of those and identifying those what those are here in kansas would probably be be a good start in having one present and you know what their model of communication looks like with their their partners and things like how we can get in and get involved in that or have somebody in that. And that might be another point is so who's doing that communication? Um, you know, is that something from the state level or is it just bringing in, you know, kind of peers who are volunteering their time for the betterment of, of the whole of state? Um, does it become an identified role at the state emergency management? I mean, these are probably some of the questions we might start looking at trying to ask and try and answer. I would agree with Jeff. Uh, in fact, I was going to suggest both of both of those organizations, and I was going to mention that in terms of utilities, uh, when I was a commissioner, I presented to a group of um, municipal utilities at one of their meetings in Manhattan, and I talked hmm. about. I actually talked about the Fusion Center and how. Uh, we try and help utilities with their uh, issues, cybersecurity being one of them. And I had one gentleman say, I don't have anything. I'm not even connected to the internet. And I said, do you get emails? And he said, yeah, but I'm not connected to the internet. Well, that's, that's the kind of issue that you run into with these small groups, like Jeff was talking about, uh, I know shouldn't say groups, but, but the small individuals and why they need to belong to a group, and most of them do. And I would suggest that we contact both of those big organizations and then somebody in terms of the utility aspect of it uh, over at the KCC, um, I am drawing a blank. Uh, it, it'll come to me at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, uh, the guy that uh, uh, sets up the, like the pipelines, the gas uh, regulation, and he works very closely with that group of 
municipal regulators, and we might uh, sort of prick his brain on groups that we could enlist to help us with getting the word out uh, about, okay, we are here to help you, but we need to know how we can help you. And we, we would like to participate in training and making training available to you, that sort of thing. Um, and as soon as I think of his name, I'll pass that along. Okay. Is it our charge to come up with a plan? So I think that uh, we don't need to struggle with how, how we're going to fund it or how, or who's going to do it. Don't we need to, to do is just to uh, outline the plan on how to do it? Or and if we clear? have, if we have recommendations on how it could be. So for example, it may be, you know, a dedicated resource at the state level who is just a coordinator to discuss cyber matters, kind of like how DHS has done it with their state liaisons or whatever, the kind of that model. It's just one goes around, sets up the meetings, talks about, you know, what resources are available to them. And that could be an easy recommendation with the resource. And then it'll be kind of up to whoever it's assigned to, um, whether it's creating headcount within state resources or contracting out with an organization to do that or whatever. Um, you know, but if, if we can come up with some recommendations on how to implement it, that'd probably be helpful, but you know, what, what a plan. I mean, that's, that's the start of it. Um, we know we can't solve it all in the short time frame of, of this task force. So, and you know, really this, this entire conversation is just a natural, uh, outgrowth of the National Governors Association or the National Association of State CIOs. You've got a, you've got a collective who speak, who, who, who get together. Again, I go back to that birds of a feather notion. And then they've identified, we, we identified that we need to, to push this down to the next level and then, you know, down to the next level after that. And so it's really just a natural outgrowth of what's already been identified at the national level. Leo Haynes. That's Leo Haynes out at the K KCC, H A Y N O S. Just Thank you for that. It wasn't two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so, I, I know Doug had also mentioned the need to have involvement from K twelve and higher ed. Um, we've talked a lot about local and, and city government stuff, you know, uh, do we have any thoughts about uh, if we need to think about uh, K-12 and higher ed as part of our plan or recommendations? I, I think absolutely. I mean, we look at a lot of the cyber attacks that have been, that have taken place recently, like when Louisiana declared emergency for multiple school districts being hit at one time. Um, I think like, is it, yeah, he didn't, Doug didn't necessarily talk about it here, but he talked about it in the session previously about these are disruption events that affect the citizens. It's not necessarily things that affect the government per se or things like that, but it impacts the citizens in some form or fashion. And for example, if schools are shut down. It kind of goes back to, you know, the pandemic. Kids are at home because they can't go to school, you know, things like that. I know when a couple of them have hit, had cyber attacks, they've closed because they can't take attendance. They can't track the kids. They can't. They can't operate and that has impacts to the parents and things like that. So, you know, I, when we look at it from a big picture of besides the cyber attack responding, it's a disruption event to the way of life um, type thing. And, and I definitely think they should be involved in the conversation. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, and I think there's a lot of, a lot of crossover. There's a lot of work that most of those uh, educational institutions do both with state and federal government. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so there's a lot of crossover and back and forth there already. Yeah, I mean, there, there's places, for example, the state has a contract for security awareness training that is at a significantly reduced rates and it is opened up to uh, political subdivisions. And there's been a couple cities that have, have latched on to it, a couple uh, counties as well. But that's, again, our problem is how do we message it out to everybody? Hey, you have this available to you. Um, you know, that, that's, that's just one of our challenges. So. so Doug had touched on that too. And I know we're focusing a lot on recommendations in the subcommittee. You know, should that be one of our recommendations that we think about is um, more or less requiring that certain contracts are contracted in a way that can be broadly uh, used or broadly available? Um, you know, is that a possibility? 
I um, think that's a great recommendation. You know, that's one of the approaches I've tried to take from my perspective is any security contract RFP I put out there is going to be open to all political subdivisions in the state. Now, how do we communicate that out it becomes the issue. So, you know, there's been a couple efforts that we've seen where um, other organizations, um, you know, have tried to go out or want to go out and build a regional RFP for their group of counties. And, you know, we can, a, a small level of effort on my part already saves them the effort of having to write the RFP themselves and say, it's just, it's out here, they're on contract. You can go through and use them without having to do your own RFP type thing. Um, but again, it's just making the resources available and communicating it. And again, if they've got specific rules on how they can procure and they have to do their own RFPs, that's that's one thing, but we try and make resources available best we can. Yeah, I, I think from our perspective, we we have we understand there are state contracts available, um, but a lot of times we don't know all that are available. So, uh, in many cases, it, it is just a communication issue, right? That we just we're just because I we're looking for a new um, we do uh, self fishing um, already, but we're looking for a new one. And, and so, you know, I'd be interested to see what the state's using because I, I have no idea. So, you know, a lot of times uh, it is just a it's kind of a knowledge issue. So it, it almost sounds like a service catalog concept where maybe another recommendation could be the creation of some type of easy to use service catalog related to these contracts and, and, and services that are available. I don't know if that would make sense, but that was one of the things that started to stick out in my mind as, as you all were talking. So uh, I, I uh, negotiated cyber terms for my company for about seven years. And, and what we did was we put some, some uh, aside from the RFPs, I'll get to that in just a second, but we put hook language in our, in our, like our blanket contracts that said that, uh, any time that um, uh, a device was purchased with upgradable software or for any device that uh, connected to the internet, uh, of course, along with the normal software stuff, that uh, uh, additional cybersecurity terms uh, were to be added to the contract and negotiated separately. And then, uh, so we, you have to be very ag aggressive to identify when a when something that's cyber related is in a contract, I'll give you an example. We, we uh, uh, saw a contract where there were going to be vending machines installed at power plants to dispense uh, gloves and safety equipment and the like. What, what wasn't evident at the, at the beginning was that each one of those uh, vending machines was going to have a Dell computer inside of it that was going to be connected to the internet to uh, phone home the turns. Uh, so that the supplier could could know when to restock, which is kind of a nifty business idea, but it opens up a bunch of security concerns. So I guess my point there is, is you really can't identify the threats for any given vendor, or I'll broaden that to, to say supply chain, until you get into the specifics of the, the goods or services that are at hand. And so you, you have to uh, negotiate that uh, and ask the, the uh, uh, questions at, at the t before the contract signed. Now, we also took a version of that and embedded it into RFIs. Um, we did that ourselves long before, and I think NIST has come out with uh, supply chain standards, uh, which when you read a NIST document, it, it, it gets way down in the weeds, and it's, it's really tough to, to uh, uh, take that and apply it to to something locally. So, but I think that it might be beneficial for uh, the state to endeavor to develop its own set of contract terms uh, that are re related to cyber and its own mechanism for triggering when a state contract uh, needs to apply those terms. And then also it needs to provide some expertise to, to negotiate those. Just, just my experience in that arena. So, so that's kind of where my mind was going a little bit too, was like a data security addendum that would be required for, for all like IT or, or new tech purchases um, that would be added and incorporated. Um, is that on the lines of what you're thinking? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, ex- ex- exactly. And, and, uh, but, but every contract's different and the ones that it's really obvious when it's an IT contract, but what's not obvious is when it's a, uh, let's just say it's an HVAC system going to go into a building, but, but, it, but it's going to, it's going to have its own, uh, control system computers that, that come along with it with software and, and on and on and on. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the state network gets stuck with equipment on there that they didn't know was coming, and and uh, uh, it was not part of a, a big IT uh, contract. Yeah, so. and I, I think that's a that's an excellent point. There's in in our discussions locally, th- there are very few things that don't have IT connected to it today. I mean, think about your own homes, right? It's it, ring, you know. Uh, Every it, 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 there's tech baked into almost everything, and that 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 can either be seen as a as a big challenge or an opportunity. But that's that's challenging, right? We're looking at HVAC systems, um, but they're not. It's like our traffic signals. They're not. They're network devices now. They're not traffic signals, and, and you know. And so so yeah, there's get into the IOT, how do you secure it? How do you, right? There's a lot of, a lot of different questions today. And, and I think that definitely goes back to that education piece and component, because like I said, in some places, it's just not, they're not aware of it. They're not aware of these things. And, you know, the vendor shows up to install the HVAC system. They just plug it into the first switch or router or whatever they can find and life goes on for everybody. But what they might not understand is that just put a back door into the environment unintentionally type thing. Um, you know, so, so again, going back to, you know, education efforts and how do we continue to, to raise awareness and things like that. So, I mean, those are all, all great points. And, uh, Mike mentioned, uh, traffic signals, uh, oddly enough, um, uh, a lot of traffic signal systems, uh, use embedded operating systems to control them, and we're seeing a lot of embedded operating systems uh, emerging with uh, serious security threats uh, that we used to think they were just a, a black box that that, that that didn't have a problem at all. But but as we go forward, literally anything that's connected to the network uh, c- could have a vulnerability. And just an example in, in my world, right, you may purchase a microscope, you endeavor to purchase a microscope and a part of that bundle, you get a computer, right? So you're purchasing a microscope, but you still get the computing device that's going to connect to the network. And I think that fits in alignment with what the rest of the group's been talking about. So do we need to consider having something like a data security addendum? Is is that another recommendation we need to consider? I I think out of, out of the task force as a whole, I think there's a, there's a space for that. Okay, so we'll just make a note as a possible recommendation on that one. Yes, I would agree. I had my phone on mute and I couldn't get it unmuted. So I, I think that that's very important uh, to, to have and to recommend that it be properly funded to, to, uh, to avert that risk. I'd like to uh, uh, bring up um, the risk equation. I know Jeff's, you probably are all very familiar with it. You know, risk is equal to threat times vulnerability times consequence. And, and if, we, if we are going to, to reduce the risk uh, of the state, we will need to look at, at, at all three of those components uh, throughout all of our discussions. Uh, I know that's probably everybody already realized that, but I thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that's a good point. So I know we're getting a little closer here towards the tail end of our discussion uh, this morning. Um, I'd like to cover, you know, what are some additional background information that this group would like to know, or, or are there people we'd like to hear from for our next meeting? I think to some of the other points, trying to pull in somebody from the, uh, League of Municipalities or Association of Counties just to kind of talk about their processes and how we could get involved or somebody could get involved, um, you know, to present to them on a regular basis, et cetera, and things like that. That might be helpful. 
or bring up some of the additional challenges they're hearing about or what they would like to see. Um, and you know, Jeff, I, is, I'm sorry to interrupt. Is there a, is there a group like that for the, for academia? Yeah. So I was just thinking about that a little bit. Um, I think from like a board of regents perspective, um, you know, CanRAN is the consortium we use to provide uh, a bunch of network and internet services. Um, and the region, I think all the regions participate in that. And there's, a, there's some community colleges and some K-12s. Um, that might be a place that we could reach out to and ask if, if they would be willing to come chat with us and, and share more from that perspective. Um, otherwise, you know, there are some groups um, like the Ritzy group, uh, which is the CIOs. But I, I think, you know, CanRAN sits uh, across several organizations, even the K-12s and community colleges. And so I think there may be some value in considering having them come. Would the Board of Education be aware of uh, organ uh, other associations? We can, we can definitely reach out and ask them. I think it's a great question. So it sounds like we have a couple of groups that we're going to look at trying to invite to our next meeting to share some some information with us. Um, is there other background information or, or data or reports or anything that would be helpful for this group for our next meeting? And if you think of anything, feel free to message Allie um, and she'll help coordinate, uh, she'll help us coordinate getting that information for this group. So it sounds like we're well on our way of identifying some collaboration opportunities. Uh, we've talked a bit about what, what the state can do to help with localities uh, related to cybersecurity. Um, it sounds like as we meet with some of these groups, we're going to learn more about how they engage with their constituents, maybe conferences or, or other such things that they do to bring, bring their folks together and, and how we might be able to leverage that for education, awareness, and further communications, and, and even just continuing the conversation. Um, we've talked a little bit about state contracts and um, the need to have perhaps a data security addendum and making sure they're written in a way that uh, is open to everyone. Uh, identified a challenge there about how do we message that? How do we make sure folks are aware of what's available and, and, and what that looks like for them? Um, I don't think, so we talked a little bit about funding specific to the one grant opportunity that's coming up. Um, are we thinking of any other resources or funding so far that, uh, that have come up as part of our conversation or, uh, and if not, they may come up later in our conversation as well. But I know we talked about the one grant opportunity. And I think, I think there's, I mean, the grants are probably the major one because they're used for various different things. Um, you know, I, I do know there's a push for on the Homeland Security grant that is existing now to focus on cyber. And I know some of the other, you know, regional groups at the county levels for various functions um, are trying to, to maximize on that and come up with kind of these group, group effort, uh, excuse me, group efforts and projects and things like that. And I think it's something we could definitely do at a bigger scale, but from the funding opportunities, that's as, that's as much as I'm aware of that might be, be possible. And, um, yeah, there could be more than other people have idea and, and it could be too is maybe the department of education has their own mechanisms for some of those things as well that we're not aware of depending on the certain groups or or how they work so it could be possible there's more out there though and i think it's something that uh, as we develop our ideas we may realize that we need additional funding again to go back to the municipal court stuff what we ended up doing was in every municipal court case, uh, the, the uh, 
Supreme Court ordered a 50 cent charge that paid for the education of, of the judges. I'm not saying that's what we can do here, but that developed uh, as the legislation came down the pike, that developed uh, towards the end. So we may be looking at this again later on. So Bill, did you have have some some questions or ideas? No, I I just didn't have my phone on mute. Sorry. Okay, no worries. I just didn't. I, I want to make sure you had a chance to to share if if you had some thoughts. Um, one of the things I know that if that was talked earlier with part of the subcommittee too was um, ways to do coordinated information gathering, analysis, or sharing. Um, so that might be something we need to keep in mind as we go forward in our future conversations. And then um, trying to look here at a couple of the other charges we had related to cross-government partnerships, the communication and collaboration, and we've touched on, on a few of those. So we're getting a little closer here. Like, what are some final thoughts or final questions or or next steps that, that everyone's thinking of that we may not have already covered. I think we got a pretty good start on a lot of the, a lot of the topics and you no, know, knowing again, it is a short turnaround. Um, I think we have some stuff we can work with and provide those recommendations and then turn around and also at least direction for a long-term goals and objectives as well. So, all right, I'll just run around uh, the group here right quick, make sure if there's any final thoughts or, or, or ideas, we, we get those. So, so Mike, I'm gonna pick on you. You're gonna pick on me for what? Any final thoughts or ideas before we look <laughs> at trying to wrap up? Um, no, I, I mean, I think, uh, again, I, you know, I think Jeff and I kind of jump into these. Um, just to just to for more really to listen and kind of see where it's going but um i think it's good you know, always have perspectives of a lot of different people and that's that's kind of what makes the the ship float so um oh i should have been i enunciated that wrong the ship ship with a p float i, I need to be careful sometimes in remote settings um so I, I think um, I think it's you're, you're you're on the right track. Um, it's just you know this is it's an expansive. When we were talking about, um, you know, it's like a lot of things. I think we're going to have to make sure we don't try and boil the ocean or eat the elephant. You use the one you want to use, um, and and kind of do some targeted things uh, to get us started because we don't have much time. So, so I agree, I, I agree, right? We eat the elephant one bite at a time and then to borrow your, your ship analogy, right? The rising tide raises all, all ships. And so um, I think that's one of the things that I'm definitely looking forward to as a outcome of, of the work that we're doing here. So, so Bill, I, I'm gonna pick on you next. Any final thoughts or, or uh, ideas? I don't have any final thoughts at this time. I want to thank everybody for for uh, volunteering to, to, to do this. And uh, I'm just happy to be able to contribute uh, whatever I can. All right, thank you. And, and Jay, uh, any final thoughts or ideas that you, you're thinking of? No, I'm good. I, I didn't realize I'd volunteered unless it's kind of volunteered the way you do in the army, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to add whatever I can, which probably isn't much. Well, we're, we're glad to have you, glad to have Bill, glad to have Mike, glad to have Jeff. You know, we, we got uh, great folks on here and, and we've made great work and, and progress today. Um, Allie, I wanna check in with you and see if there's anything uh, else that, that we need to be aware of or, or that we may need to cover here before we look at wrapping up. We're in good shape. Sorry, have a little headset going on here. Um, I think we're in good shape. I'm, I've been taking notes and I'm gonna put everything together and hopefully a logical, organized way that makes sense for everybody to kind of read through and highlighting some of those different themes and buckets where we've identified 
either some fairly clear recommendations already at this point or ideas that recommendations could come from. Um, and I'll make sure to send a follow-up email to the entire subcommittee. Um, and then additionally, uh, you know, just looking at some of the reports that Doug talked about and some other things, you know, if there are other data reports uh, that you would like to see, um, anytime you want to reach out to me, just let me know and I'll see what I can find. I will be putting those in our SharePoint uh, where we keep a lot of things. Um, so I encourage you all to go back there and read through some of the information that Jeff has already added to the, the SharePoint site. Um, and, but whenever we do get things added, I'll make sure you know, in those emails that I send to you, let you know that new documents have been added and here's what they are. Um, and I'll just continue to put the link in that email so that way you know how to get there. Okay, excellent. Um, that'll be, be very helpful. Um, well, I think we've made great progress today. I appreciate the open uh, discussion. Uh, uh, even sometimes, you know, maybe the more controversial uh, topics that were discussed, I think those are all important. Uh, as part of this this broad based conversation that we're having, you know, I think all ideas are good, and it just helps us um, really make sure we're casting that wide net to think about the the issues and the concerns, making sure that we're trying to cover this as comprehensively as we can. Um, and um, I just look forward to our continued conversations, and uh, look forward to working with you all on in, in the next session. So, uh, with that. Uh, I will pause for a moment in case there's any final thoughts before we adjourn. Yeah, just real quickly, you know, and keep in mind, you know, as we start talking about things, there is going to be some crosstalk between what we discuss here and what some of the other subcommittees are probably addressing as well. Um, so do keep those in mind and, and be aware of maybe the, as we talk about in the larger task force, if they kind of bring up a nugget that might be good for us to come back and and work through to see if, you know, what we have might add because the point of like the inventory, I know that was discussed in the, in the, uh, the strategic um, visioning and planning subcommittee as well. So I, there, there's a lot of that and training obviously with the workforce development, things like that. So there will be some crosstalk, but just keep your ears to the, to the ground on, on what might come out of the, the larger task force meetings as well, because um, there is, there will be some definite momentum on a lot of these uh, topics. So, And if anyone is curious about what some of the other subcommittees have talked about, but you didn't get a chance to, to watch or sit in on any of those, um, the, the link to the SharePoint folder, you can go into the other subcommittee folders as well and, and look at some of the materials they have. Um, uh, and as, as I get you know, the, the slide decks from our different presenters, I'll put those in there so you can go back and watch those. And, um, and also with these videos being streamed or these meetings being streamed on YouTube. Um, if you ever want to go back and, and listen through any of those, I, I know your time is limited. So I, you know, some of those are going the full two hours or hour 45. So just kind of skip it around and listen in where you like. Okay, Jeff, great point. Um, we'll keep our eyes and ears open for those, those other pieces there. Ali, I, I just want to take a moment and, and thank you for your tireless work here and helping us stay organized and helping us get connected with the resources we need for this subcommittee. Uh, you've been fantastic. So thank you so much for your help. And uh, with that, we will look at adjourning just a few minutes early here. So thank you all. And we'll look forward to seeing you and, and working with you in our next session. All right. See you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.